so the title of our message tonight is going to be The Dysfunctional Family. And what we're going to do is look at what that is, what causes it, and what's the cure, what fixes that dysfunctional family, right? Um, so first of all, uh, Brother Neil, I think I sent you a copy of the prayer list. Did you get that? Yes, sir. You got it? Okay. Uh, uh, John Boy, can y'all hear Brother Neil when he's talking? I'm just trying to get this thing sorted out. Huh? You had to speak a little louder. I can't hear you. On my screen? Oh, there we go. I got it now. Yeah. Thank you. I, I just figured that out. Thank you. All right. Well, um, okay. Did I? Uh, did you get the prayer list that I sent you? I sent it on your messenger. Yes, sir. I have it right here. Okay. Um, what we're going to do tonight, we're going to just, uh, I want you to keep that handy. What we're going to do tonight is go to the Lord in prayer. First of all, we'll sing a couple songs. And then we're going to do our Bible study. And then at the end of the Bible study, we're just going to go through our prayer list. Uh, so if anybody has a prayer request tonight, what I'm going to do is uh, I'll, I'll have um, the men here in the chapel start praying first, and then when y'all are done, then I'll have Brother Neil pray for the um, prayer requests that are on the list, and whatever he misses, I'll get the rest, and then I'll close this in prayer. But first of all, we're going to pray and sing a couple songs. All right, let's, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Our Father, we give you thanks again for this time together, and again, thank you for this uh, means to be able to speak to one another and have this meeting uh, in two different countries at, at one time, Lord, and we, we thank you for the opportunity we have to serve you, to open up your word and look into it together. Uh, Father, we thank you for the privilege and the responsibility we have to pray, and so tonight we pray as we have this brief meeting that uh, everything that we do will glorify you, that your word will be preached clearly and received heartily. Uh, you'll open every eye, touch every heart, meet every need tonight. But Lord, we pray for your guidance, and your wisdom. Pray for your cleansing of our hearts, Lord, so that we can hear your word. And Father, if there's anything we need to hear specifically, individually, Lord, I pray you'll speak those things to our hearts tonight. And Grant us repentance to acknowledging of the truth. And Lord, help us to uh, order our lives in the way that would glorify you. And we thank you for these things tonight in Christ's name. Amen. <clears throat> well, first of all, could somebody grab one of the hymn books and, and look up the hymn, What Can Wash Away My Sins? I don't have that hymn book here, so we'll sing What Can Wash Away My Sins. If y'all are talking, I can't hear. What is it? All right. All right, 138. Let me find the key. Y'all know this, right? Page 138. All right, well, let's sing. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is a flow that makes me white as snow. No other fountain I know. 
nothing but the blood of Jesus for my cleansing this I see nothing but the blood of Jesus for my this my plea nothing but the blood of Jesus oh precious is the flow that makes me white as snow no other found I know nothing but the blood of Jesus nothing can for sin atone nothing but the blood of Jesus not of good that I have done nothing but the blood of Jesus Precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No other found I know, nothing but the blood of Jesus. This is all my hope and peace, nothing but the blood of Jesus. This is all my righteousness. Nothing but the blood of Jesus Oh, precious is the flow That makes me white as snow No other fount I know Nothing but the blood of Jesus well, Let's sing that chorus without the guitar one time Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No other fount I know, nothing but the blood of Jesus. Amen. All right, well, uh, it's late over here. It's, we're, we're doing this at 8 o'clock here tonight in order to be 7 o'clock there to stay with our schedule. So, we're going to move right along. Amen? <clears throat> nothing but the blood of Jesus. In case you don't know that, there's nothing else that can wash away your sins. Amen? Just putting your faith and your trust in the finished work of Jesus, what He did on the cross. Uh, without that, there is no eternal life. But when you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, you repent and are willing to turn from your sins and place your trust in Christ. And when you do that, He comes into your life, washes away your sins, and makes you a new creature. Amen. Uh, now, we know salvation is something God does. We can't even believe on Him. We can't even turn to Him unless He draws us, according to the Scriptures, right? Jesus said, No man can come to Me except My Father which hath sent Me draw him, and I'll raise him up at the last day. So salvation is of the Lord. If a man or woman or child comes to Christ, it's only because God has drawn them and done a work in them. Amen? And so if God is drawing you tonight, if He's doing that work in your life tonight, then I challenge you tonight to make this the time that you call upon Him, cry out to Him, and surrender your life to Him. Amen? Ask Him to save you. Ask Him to come into your life and, and open your eyes and save you. Amen? All right. Well, we're going to go to Ephesians. I want to talk a bit tonight. Um, I heard a message on this, and of course my, my message tonight, my outline, is not going to be anywhere close to that, but it gave me just the idea of the subject. And as I was listening to that message, um, I thought, boy, he, he's really missing it, right? Because sometimes people um, try to put out the, just put out little fires instead of going to the root problem and dealing with the root cause of issues. So the dysfunctional family, now that's a pretty much an American term, you know, it's been around for a long time, but um, when we 
use that term in America, it means a lot of different things. You know, it's not just Christians that use that term, right? Matter of fact, the world probably is who coined that term, right? Because of all the problems that men and women and children have in the world, right? Um, so, a dysfunctional family. You know, we, we talk about that. Um, we talk about people who have children that are addicted to drugs, parents that are addicted to drugs, uh, parents who are drunkards, children who are drunkards. And as you know, uh, Brother Ernesto and Brother Neil and Sebastian, we can all, and probably the rest of y'all too, but we can personally testify to the struggle that's caused in a person's life when they're addicted to drugs or addicted to alcohol and the terrible effect that it has on families. Amen? Uh, those things destroy families. Just a little alcohol. You know, people say, well, we, we have Christian liberty, so, you know, I can just drink a little alcohol. I don't know how many times I've heard people say that. I can quit any time I want. I'm not addicted, right? But then you see them some years later and their whole family's a mess. Their whole life is falling apart just because of one little drug that they get addicted to and it destroys, it ruins and destroys their lives. Amen? So a dysfunctional family, uh, the first thing I wanted to ask, I mean, we hear a lot about the dysfunctional family and we get a lot of different descriptions about what that means and what causes that. Uh, families to be dysfunctional. You know what dysfunctional means, right? It it means, of course, it doesn't function right. You know, we people tend to in these in this generation, people tend to want to be independent, right? Even in families, people want to be independent instead of being a functional family. They want to all be separate, but yet be in the family. Amen. And, but it don't work that way. It just you, you can't have a functional family if you're not functioning right. Amen? So what is a dysfunctional family? Now, there's only one functional family, and that's a biblical family. Right? So a, a dysfunctional family, really, if, if you just boil it down to the bottom line, it's just an unbiblical family. It's a family that has no idea what a family really is because they don't read the Bible or they don't know the Lord. And so even if they did read the Bible, they wouldn't understand it, right? People, people have their own ideas about everything. When you're born into this world, you're born separated from God. You're born without the Holy Spirit. If you're raised in a Christian home, then you can, you can receive uh, much truth um, in your life and grow up with that as part of your character and part of your life but unless you're born again it's really not even the knowledge that you have is not functional because you don't have the holy spirit you don't have the true understanding about what it means number one to be a christian number two to be a family right so let me just start by saying this the first institution that god made in creation was the family before he made a government, he made a family. Before he made a church, he made a family, right? The family is the first thing God made. He, he, took, he, he created Adam from the dust of the earth. He made his body. He created him. And, and then the Bible says he breathed into him the breath of life. And man became a living soul, right? So he was a physical body. And then God breathed into him the breath of life. And he became a living soul. That's why it says we're made in the image of God. A living soul means that you, you are an eternal spiritual being. You were created that way. Your body was created first. And then you, when it says he breathed into him the breath of life, that's you. Right? That's you. Your body is not you. Your body is the house that you live in. Right? Uh, we love these bodies, though, don't we? Because they're so much a part of us, and we like to fix them up and decorate them up and make them feel good and put smell-good stuff on them and eat stuff we like, you know. Uh, and, and God made the body, right? And He made it with desires and with senses and all of those things, right? But your body is not you. Your body is your house. 
Now, the difference in the physical house you live in and your body is you're not connected to your physical house, but you are connected to your body, and it's intertwined, right? And so it's part of us, but it's not who we are. Amen? You, when your body dies, when you die, let me tell you this, when you die, <coughs> you don't cease to exist. Death is when your, your body and your soul separate. God breathed into Adam, man, the breath of life, and he became a living soul. <coughs> when you die physically, that's when you, the person I'm talking to, separates out of your body. When your body, go, your body goes back to the dust and you go back to God, right? And God either going to put you in heaven or he's going to put you in hell, depending on whether you were saved or not, right? Because Adam's sin, death passed upon all men for that all have sinned right so not only will you physically die you will die physically once but then if you're not born again you'll die a second death which is an eternal death in the lake of fire according to revelations chapter 20 so very important your your body is not you 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 live in that body and that body is your house and that's why the Bible tells us that we're to control our bodies, right? Our body, when, when Adam sinned, he, he, he spiritually died and, his, and he became just a soulish creature living by his emotions, how he feels, and being controlled by his body, right? People do most everything they do to gratify some part of their body, right? Uh, the lust of the eyes, Right when when Eve saw the tree, that it was good to look at. Right, uh, when when she saw that the tree was this, it would be would make her wise. Right, the lust of the flesh that it's good for food. Right, it would gratify her body. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes. She saw that it was good to look at. And the pride of life, it would make her wise, right? And the Bible says those are the three areas of temptation that Satan used to, to snare Eve so that he could use Eve to snare Adam, right? Of course, Eve was deceived. Adam wasn't. Adam knew full well what he's doing. Therefore, it's his fault, not hers. If he would have, if he would have said, no, I'm not eating that fruit, then everything would have been fine. But instead... Satan knew that he had to use the woman to get to the man, and he did. And instead of saying no, Adam went ahead and did it. And if you'll go read it in Genesis 3, it, it's God said to Adam, because you hearkened unto your wife, the, unto the voice of your wife, and did eat, cursed is the ground for your sake, right? God already told Adam not to do that, right? But Adam didn't obey God. And because Adam disobeyed God, men became sinners, right? Now, the woman doesn't have the seed, the man does, and God didn't tell the woman, he told the man. So the responsibility was Adam's, and because Adam sinned, death passed upon all men. If Adam had not sinned, then his children would have not been born sinners, even though his wife had sinned, right? His children would have still been born sinless. But because Adam sinned, God told him, the day you eat, you will surely die. The day thou eatest, thou shalt surely die. We know he didn't die physically, but we know he did die spiritually. Spiritually, he died, he was separated, and cut off from God, and his, he became a sinner. His nature became sinful, and his children were born sinners, right? Now, think about this. I just want to use this kind of to, to help you understand what I'm saying. Jesus Christ was born of a virgin, right? According to the Scriptures, he, she, he didn't have an earthly father. He, God was his father. But yet, Mary was a sinner, right? Mary was a sinner, but yet, because Jesus didn't have an earthly father, he was able to be born sinless. Because the mother doesn't bear the seed, the father does, right? And the baby is carried in, a, in, a, in her womb and is fed by the placenta. That, th this was amazing when I first studied this out and read it right because you, you wonder if Jesus if Mary was a sinner how could Jesus be in her womb and not come out a sinner right and it's because the the blood of the mother never enter 
acts with the blood of the baby. His blood was still spotless blood. When the baby gets fed in the womb, it's fed by the placenta. The mother eats the food. The food is absorbed into the placenta through the mother's blood, but then the uh, uh, from the mother's blood. But then the the placenta absorbs the nutrients in the baby's blood through the umbilical cord, or I call it the biblical cord. I don't know what, how you say it, umbilical cord. But anyway, however that works, the baby's blood and the mother's blood never touch. The baby is fed from the nutrients in the placenta without the mother's blood and the baby's blood ever touching, right? That's why I'm telling you that even though Eve had sinned, if Adam had have obeyed God instead of listening to his wife, now I'm not saying that there aren't times you shouldn't listen to your wife, uh, but you shouldn't, especially if she's trying to get you to do something you know God doesn't want, right? Then you just say no, right? And Adam should have done that because Adam's the head. Adam was the head. Adam knew. Adam was not deceived. God made the man the head of the woman, right? And God gives wisdom to a man, right? Now, because of the fall... Now, here's, here's why I want to take this, right? What is a dysfunctional family? Well, a dysfunctional family is an unbiblical family. It's a family who its members do not obey God. Now, it could be one member. It could be all the members. But all people... Now, listen to this. All men, all women, all children are born sinners. So a dysfunctional family is a family who fails to obey God, fails to follow God's pattern in what He says a family is to do, right? Well, what's the cause of that? What causes man to, to disobey God? Well, I just basically told you that. The curse, right? When Adam disobeyed God, before he disobeyed God, God said, the day you eat, you will surely die. And so when he ate that fruit that day, not when Eve ate it, but when Adam ate it, Adam died. Spiritually, I, I think Eve did, but, but the responsibility wasn't on her. And she didn't bear the seed. So when Adam sinned, because he has the seed, his seed was corrupted. And when he impregnated his wife, the first baby ever born was born a sinner because he was born of a a sinful man. So the cause of a dysfunctional, and I'm talking about a family. You know, people can be dysfunctional. But when we say dysfunctional, we're talking about an organism or 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 a system not functioning correctly, right, together. Right, a family is a is a a unit of individuals, right? And and God has ordained what a family is to be and what it's to be like, right? Even in the garden, if Adam had not listened to Eve, if Eve had not listened to the devil, if she hadn't let the devil trick her into eating that apple, there wouldn't have been, maybe he would have found another way. I don't know. It's inevitable that it happened, though, right? But I'm just saying, if Eve had to listen to her husband, because God told Adam, Adam told Eve. And the devil said to Eve, Did God really say that? And I think she, not only was he causing her to question God, but he was causing her to question her husband, right? The husband is the head. And this is just biblical, biblical order, right? I know one lady wrote a book. Uh, the title of the book was Me, Obey Him. You know, my goodness, he's an idiot. Why should I obey him, right? And and that's typically the way people think. But regardless of if he's an idiot or not, um, if you obey him, do what God says, wait on the Lord, God will take care of you, right? He'll take care of you eventually, right? So, and then it's the same thing with the husband. I'm not, How can I love her? She's contentious, right? But in both cases, and we're going to see this in just a minute, in both cases, God requires each individual to obey Him whether the other one is doing it or not. And we'll see that in just a minute. But the cause of the dysfunction in the family today, and let me say this, because every funk, every family on the planet today is dysfunctional. Every planet. Every family. Some more than others. But every family has struggles. Every family has problems. Every family has to struggle with, with uh, dying to themselves and putting down the flesh and 
being filled with the Spirit and living for Christ. It's a constant struggle. And sometimes we fail. Hey, the greatest man in the Bible, I think, besides Job, was King David. And he ended up with one of the most dysfunctional families in the world. Although he was called a man after God's own heart. So this isn't something that's isolated to certain people, certain families. We all have a dysfunctional family to some extent, right? And to the extent we disobey God, that's the extent to which we have a dysfunctional family and why we have problems. And it's because we have those because we have a sin nature. Even though we're born again, we have a new nature, we still have that old sin nature there that likes to fight, right? The Spirit wars against the flesh and the flesh against the Spirit so that we can't do what we would. Amen? The Scripture says there is a struggle going on there. And so we, as, as individuals in every family, have to obey God. If you don't want to be part of the problem in a dysfunction, dysfunctional family, then you need to be obedient, right? But in order to be obedient, you've got to know what the Bible says. So, what's the solution? All right, we, know, we know what a dysfunctional family is. It's a messed up family that don't function right, right? King David's family fell apart after he committed adultery with Bathsheba, right? I'm going to tell you, man, adultery will destroy your life. Right? Young men, fornication. Young ladies, fornication. That is sex outside of marriage. Will ruin your life. But we don't want to start there. It, it's true. And, it's, and there, there has never been a time or a place or any family or any individual in history that if they committed those sins that it didn't create problems for them in their life and in their family once they got married whether it's adultery or fornication. And you know, fornication is just uh, sexual activity when you're not married of any kind, right? Adultery is when you either uh, lie with a man's wife or a woman lies with a, a woman's husband, another woman's husband, right? It's adultery. And the Bible says, whoremongers and adulterers God will judge. So, it, you know, if God is a merciful God, I mean, we know He is, because if He weren't, probably every one of us in this room right now would be dead. Because adulterers and whoremongers, God will judge. And so, thank God for His mercy. Amen? I know I failed in that before I got married. I'm terribly. I mean, I was a wicked guy before I met Jesus. I'm not even going to talk about it. Right? And you don't have to be the most wicked fornicator in the world to be a sinner. All you got to do is really just do it one time. Right? Or, or, you know, for the most part, if you look around us today, here in, here in America, they're in Belize. People sleep together and live together every day and act like it's normal. And, and, and really don't really think that there's going to be any consequences for it. Because they're blinded, they're darkened, and they, they don't think it's... Un not okay but it is and I, I want to tell you this tonight because if your whole life has been a mess from the beginning it don't have to be anymore amen we can't fix what's already been broke I mean we can't stop what's already happened but we can we can move forward the right way and begin to work on our lives and begin to be the kind of people individually that God wants us to be so that our families can be functional, properly functional, right? And don't misunderstand me again. Every family, you know, there's nobody perfect, and we're not using that to make an excuse for sin. We're just saying that there's going to be problems. Even if you make up your mind, even when you do make up your mind to do the right thing, what happens? Well, the devil comes along and your flesh comes along and the world comes along and tries to make sure you're not able to do it, right? The moment you make up your mind to do right, you're going to find out how sinful you are. You're going to find out how weak you are. You're going to find out how sin is in, dwelling inside of you every moment and you have to fight it. You have to struggle with it to overcome it. Amen? So let me, let me answer the question. What, what is... A dysfunctional family. We already said it's an unbiblical family that's messed up. And we could give examples like King David's family. Even Solomon's family became very dysfunctional because instead of obeying God, uh, Solomon, the wisest man that ever lived, had 300 wives and 700 concubines. 
And if you go read the Bible and read his life, you'll see how terribly dysfunctional and messed up his family was because of that. You can't have two wives and not have a dysfunctional family, much less 300. Amen? God made, for this cause shall a man leave his father and mother and cleave to his wife. Both of those are singular. A man leaves his father and mother and cleaves to his wife, the one wife. You add anything to that, it's adultery. Amen? The two become one flesh. And what God hath joined together, let no man put asunder. God said that. Amen? Uh, somebody, we were talking about this the other day, but somebody said, um, it's better to wait long than to marry wrong. Amen? It's better, it's better to get your heart right with God, number one, and then wait for God, pray in, in prayer to bring the right person or the right kind of person into your life to marry so that you don't make a mistake and end up in a miserable life with a dysfunctional family. Amen? Now thank God for His deliverance. Thank God He can turn a curse into a blessing. He can make a bad situation into something good. I know He did it for me. Amen? King David sinned against God and uh, committed adultery and, and messed up his whole life and his whole family for a long time. For about five years, David had a messed up life. But God turned it around. God take the year that the locusts have eaten and make it fresh and new. Amen. We got a Savior out of that sinful relationship of David and Bathsheba. So look now with me. Uh, we, know, we know what a dysfunctional family is. We know what caused it. Let's see how we can fix it for just a minute. We'll just look at a few things here. We're not going to be long. But look at Ephesians chapter 5. I want you all to understand something. I, I'm not standing up here doing this because I think I'm looking at a bunch of dysfunctional families and I want to straighten them out, right? Um, I'm a Christian, and I hope you are, and I have a family. Mine, some of them are sitting right here. Uh, this is us. This is me, you, each of us individual. But this is Grace Baptist Church, and I'm the pastor here, and I want to share with you from the Scripture what the Bible says about the family. That way you can look at the Scriptures, you can look at yourself, and you can make the determination on your own whether or not you're, you're, you have a dysfunctional family. You may have a wonderful family, but you got some areas of dysfunction in it, and you can, you know, look at the Bible, look at what it says, and then work on those areas, right? We cannot. We all have to do that. So let's let's look first at Ephesians chapter five. I want to read um, just a few things before I get to the main part of this text. Look at chapter five, verse seventeen. I didn't make an outline on this. I'm just going to go through the scripture here and do this pretty much from memory. Look at verse uh, seventeen. Wherefore, be not unwise but understanding what the will of the Lord is. Now, how many of y'all sitting here listening to me right now think you're wise? You know, most people think they're wise. But I'm going to tell you something. If you don't know the Word of God, you don't have much wisdom. Right? Do you know the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom? You don't even, until you begin to fear God, you don't have wisdom. That's the beginning of, of wisdom. Amen. You can have worldly wisdom, but we're talking godly wisdom, biblical wisdom. Wherefore, be not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. You know, God has a will, right? And if you haven't, listen to me, if you haven't surrendered yourself to Christ, then probably what you're trying to do is live your own life according to your will, and you want what you want, and it don't matter what anybody else thinks, and you'll do whatever you have to do to get it. Right? Even if you have to pretend a little while to get what you want. Right? But there is a God in heaven, and He has a will for every one of us. But He says, Be not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. So how can you know the will of the Lord? Well, by knowing what He wrote in His book right here. The Bible. Ernesto used to sing a song about the Bible. I can't remember what it was, though. We used to sing it. 
The Bible is the book for me, right? Isn't that what it was called? We'll have to ask him to sing that one day. The Bible is the book for me. Wherefore, be not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. And notice this. And. And. Be not drunk with wine. Wherein is excess. And the word excess there means to be overtaken by it, basically. to it's dissipation, to be controlled by it. Now some people think that's just drinking too much. That, the word excess means don't excessively drink wine. That's not what that means. He says, be not drunk with wine wherein is excess. Being drunk with, being drunk with wine is where the excess is, right? Wherein is excess. Being drunk is excess, period. But what does it mean to be drunk? How do you know if you're drunk, right? See, some people think being drunk just means you're so, you, you can't see and you stumble and you fall down. But you can be drunk. You can be, notice, notice let me just give the contrast here. Be not drunk with wine wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. So there's a contrast here. And I, ba I believe basically what he's telling us here is, is the word drunk doesn't always just mean being fallen down drunk. If you hadn't drank any alcohol in a year and, and you take two tablespoons of NyQuil, you're probably going to get a little drunk because it's 10% alcohol. And you know, just a little bit of alcohol will affect your emotions. Just a little bit of alcohol will affect your decision-making process you know when you get a little drunk I, I watched a friend of mine he, he he's exercising his Christian liberty he thinks but I think he's becoming a drunkard that's my opinion but I watched him sit there and after the first little glass you know I know the guy he's a very reserved guy after the first glass he got kind of giddy he started giggling about everything after the second one man he was just plum goofy saying all kind of stupid stuff and he wasn't falling down drunk he just drank two little jiggers of that stuff right so being drunk doesn't always mean staggering falling down drunk that's that's being pretty drunk there i've been drunk and i've been real drunk and i've been so drunk i didn't even know i was drunk i've been so drunk that i drove with one eye closed just so i wouldn't see double and i drove for hours and when i got where i was going i didn't even know how i got there when i got there when i looked around the next morning i thought how, where how did i get here that's being drunk, right? But that's not the only sign of being drunk, right? I think he's talking about being controlled by alcohol or any kind of drug, really. But look what he said. Be not drunk with wine wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. Now, some people think being filled with the Spirit means you speak in tongues, right? And I'm not going to go into that right now, but that's not what it means. Some people believe that speaking, uh, that being filled with the Spirit means you, uh, you get all excited and start jumping up and down and yelling and hollering and all those things and turning backflips and jumping over the pews and running around screaming. Some of them even get out and start barking like a dog. I saw one preacher on, on TV one day. They, were, they said they were having a revival and all the preachers were walking around on the stage cackling like a, a chicken and they were all laughing and rolling over on the on the podium up there and 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 by the time it was over they said oh the spirit of god just moved upon this place today well there was a spirit movement i don't believe it was the spirit of god amen that's not being filled with the spirit or the holy spirit anyway amen be not drunk with wine wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. Don't be controlled by alcohol. Don't let alcohol take over your mind. And you don't have to drink a whole lot of it for that to happen. Amen? It's not for kings, O Lemuel, so, uh, Proverbs 31 tells us. It's not for kings, O Lemuel, to drink wine or strong drink, lest they pervert the judgment of the people. He doesn't say it's, n it's not for kings to, to, to get drunk. He said it's not for kings to drink wine. See? God's Word says wine is a mocker. Strong drink is raging. And whoever is deceived by it is not wise. Look not upon the wine when it is red, when it moves itself aright. For in the end it biteth like an adder. Right? 
But even even before then, if you drink a little wine, it's going to affect your decision-making process. That's why he says, don't be drunk with wine, wherein it's excess, but be filled with the Spirit. Instead of drinking alcohol to get your good feeling and your emotional thing, pray and get filled with the Spirit. Now notice what he said. I want to show you the results of being filled with the Spirit. Notice what he said. Be not drunk with wine wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit, speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. So when you're filled with the Spirit, there will be a song in your heart. There will be a melody in your heart. But he says, speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, making melody in your heart to the Lord, giving thanks always for all things unto God and the Father in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. If you're filled with the Spirit, you're going to have a, a rejoicing, thankful heart. You're not going to be a whining, pouting, grumbling, griping, complaining person all the time. That's part of being filled with the Spirit. And if you're doing all that, you know you're not filled with the Spirit. But let, let me say this, because most people think being filled with the Spirit is some kind of emotional thing that the Spirit takes you over takes control of you. But really, if, if you'll just notice it, there, there may be times that happens, but, but notice what he says here. Speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Be filled with the Spirit. Flip over to Colossians chapter 3. i got to make this point because it's very important. <clears throat> Colossians chapter 3, verse 16. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. Instead of being filled with wine, be filled with the word. Amen? Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom. You hear that? Okay, let, let's do this. Let's say, okay, be not drunk with wine, but be filled with the Spirit. So be filled with the Spirit or... Let the Word of Christ dwell in you richly. Those, those two things are synonymous. Being filled with the Spirit and letting the Word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, those two are synonymous. But understand when he says, let the Word of Christ dwell in you. He didn't say memorize some Scripture, right? and Let it get in your mind. No, he says, let the Word of Christ dwell in you, right? You know the Word of God. You've been taught by God the Word of God. Let it dwell in you. Obey the Word of God. Notice what he says. Let it, the Word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom. That's application. That, that's you living out the Word of God. That's what wisdom is. Right? That's how you're filled with the Spirit. You can't be filled with the Spirit if the Word of Christ is not dwelling in you richly. Every time you sin, you, you quench the Spirit or you grieve the Spirit. But being filled with the Spirit means that you allow the Spirit of God to control you as you're obeying the Word of God. If you're not obeying the Word of God, you'll be grieving the Spirit and quenching the Spirit. The two go together. You can't be filled without the, with the Spirit without the Word of Christ dwelling in you richly. But notice, don't just take my word for it. Look what he says teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your heart to the Lord, and in whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, giving thanks to God and the Father by Him. So if you read these two passages, Ephesians 5 and Colossians 3, you read them side by side, you'll see that being filled with the Spirit and letting the Word of Christ dwell in you richly have the same result, and they're synonymous. They're, he's talking about the same thing. And so let me, let me show you one way that's true. What's the very next verse say, right? Whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, giving thanks to God and the Father by Him. Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as it is fit in the Lord. Now, one lady said, well, that means as it is fit in the Lord, that means if he's doing right, then I should submit to him. That's not what that means. That means submitting to him is what is fit in the Lord. Right? Now, flip back over to um, Ephesians chapter 5. 
Be not drunk with wine wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit, speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, making melody in your heart to the Lord. That's an overflow of the Spirit giving thanks always for all things to God and the Father in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now notice, submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God. Now, this is, this is the place where a lot of my charismatic friends go, take, go off in left field. They say, see there, that just says for all everybody to submit themselves to everybody. Right? Submit yourselves to one another. So nobody's really in charge. We just submit ourselves to each other. But that's not what that means, obviously, right? When he says submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of the Lord, he, he now, he, 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 the next verse, he begins to categorize what that means, right? Submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of the Lord, right? And he tells us, he, he begins to categorize that and tell us what that means. Wives, Submit yourselves unto your own husband. Notice it says your own husband. Right? Um, Brother Nesto's wife doesn't have to submit to my headship as her husband, right? Because I'm not her husband. As a matter of fact, even in the church, uh, I'm not, I, I wouldn't deal with another man's wife without his presence, right? Because... Whatever counsel I give is going to be family counsel to a husband and a wife, and particularly to the husband, and then he'll be able to explain that to his wife, right? But notice, he says, Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husband, as unto the Lord. You see that? As unto the Lord. Well, he, he's not acting right. Well, it doesn't say as he is acting right. It says as unto the Lord. So when you're submitting to your husband... You're submitting as if you're submitting to the Lord because He's the one that commands it here, right? Y'all with me? Now, notice it doesn't say, Husbands, tell your wives to submit to you as is fit in the Lord. No. He's not talking to the husband. Ladies, y'all listening to me? This is written to you. God's telling you personally, right? You're the wife. Wives, submit yourselves. The husband can't submit you. It's not his job. You know, some men try to do that. They try to beat their wives into subjection, all kind of... It don't work. And God knows it don't work. That's why he tells the wife. If the wife wants to be obedient and be a follower of Christ and obey him, then she's going to have to submit herself to her husband. Or she's disobeying God. Now, husbands, you don't get off the hook, right? We're talking about a dysfunctional family here. Husbands, this this is the hard part, y'all. Somebody said it, the woman told me one time, she said, boy, it's really hard to submit. I said, we well, ought to try loving an unsubmissive woman. You ought to try loving a submissive woman the way Christ loved the church. It's hard to, 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 the, to love a woman the way Christ loved your wife, the way Christ loved the church, it's hard to, to, to do that with the most submissive woman in the world because man's heart, you know, like we said from the beginning, we still have an old sin nature. Sometimes we don't even realize we're doing wrong sometimes, right? And then later God convicts us and we say, oh man, I can't believe I was doing that. But notice he says, wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. So when you're submitting to your husband, you're not doing it because your husband is submit-worthy. You're not doing it because he's such a good man. You're doing it as to the Lord because the Lord, if, you're, if you submit to your husband, then you're obeying God and he is worthy. And it's him that says to do it. Why? Verse 23, For the husband is the head of the wife even as Christ is the head of the church. I had one, one lady told me, well, I'm not going to get married then, right? I, I'm just not going to get married. And I said, well, okay, that's up to you. But, you know, if, you can, if you're not going to be the problem in a family and be a part of the dysfunctional family, you're going to have to honor your father and submit to him just like you would a husband before you get married. That's how it works. We'll see that in a second. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church. In the same manner that Christ is the head of the church, and you know the church can't tell Christ what to do, right? 
but in the same way that Christ is the head of the church and is the Savior of the body, in the same way the husband is the head of the wife. Now I want to tell you something. Uh, uh, a, a man that doesn't take care of his responsibility is going to be in big trouble when he stands before God. And I tell you, I've learned this the hard way. When a woman obeys God and submits to Him, when a husband is not, God will take care of that husband. God will chastise that husband for disobeying and disrespecting not only him, but his wife. If you're one of God's children, you're one of God's daughters. That's what God said to me one day. I told my wife, I said, well, well I'm your head and you're supposed to submit to me. And by the time I got to the door leaving that day, the Holy Spirit, God said to me, yeah, you're the head, all right. You're the head of my daughter. So you get back over there and apologize to her. <laughs> That's my daughter that you're the head of. Don't forget that, right? I'm the head of God's daughter. But he's my head. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 3 says, The man is the head of the woman. Christ is the head of the man. And God is the head of Christ. So there's three heads. Right? The man has a head. And I think you'd rather your wife whip you then God whip you because when God whips you you're going to know you got whipped amen so you better behave yourself <laughs> you better treat her right even if she ain't submissive treat her right anyway amen God help us do that I know that's that's talk right now but man help us Lord wives submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord do it as if you're doing it to God because he's the one that commands it husband for the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church and is the Savior of the body. It's the husband's duty to love his wife like Christ loved the church and sanctify her. Did you know it's the husband's job to, to grow his wife to become more like Christ? Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. Well, you've got to really be saved to do this, ladies. Huh? I I don't know if I'd want to be in that position or not. I guess he didn't make me a woman, so I I I, I would really wouldn't know. But I'm told by the godly women I know that it's a delight to do this. That it's not a burden, because when you obey God, God blesses you no matter what your husband does. Amen. If you're following Christ and you're living for Him, e even if your husband disobeys God, God's gonna still bless you. And he'll probably bless your husband because of you. And vice versa. We don't want to be like the Muslims, you know, and try to, you know, go get us a stick and whip our wife with it, right? They got their little rules, you know, how hard they can hit them and where they can bruise them and all that stuff. Good thing we're not Muslims, huh? Husbands, now we're going to talk about the husband. See, now the wife is to be submissive just like Christ is to the church. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ loved the church. So if the wife is to submit to her husband, even as the church submits to Christ, the husband is to love the wife the same way Christ loves the church. Amen? You figure that out. When you get it figured out, help me to understand what that means, because I sure, I sure think sometimes that I don't really understand that. I think I do. even as Christ loved the church and gave Himself for it. So it's a matter of a man giving his life for his wife. Now, he's got, a man has to be wise. Don't misunderstand me. You can't give your wife everything she wants. You've got you to gotta be wise. You've got to walk in wisdom. You've got to be a good steward. You've got to take care of business and do things right. You can't sin to please your wife, right? And vice versa. That's what Adam did. And you see what happened to us. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ loved the church and gave Himself for it, that He might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the Word, that He might present it to Himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. So ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. So 
so ought men to love their own wife, their wives as their own body. You know, I think it's true of everybody. If we'd love everybody else the way we love ourselves, the way we love our bodies, we'd be we'd be in good shape. But especially married couples, especially a husband, right? Boy, he wants his wife to cook his food, doesn't he? Take care of his body. He wants his wife to wash his clothes, take care of business and do all that. So his body is fixed. But what about her? What you doing for her? Huh? Got to do both now. I'm not pitting one against the other. It goes both ways. A, wi- a, wa- a wife has needs. Right? Just like the man has needs. And, and, and a husband and wife are to take care of one another's needs. The husband is the head, yes. But he's really got to be careful how he handles and takes care of his wife. Amen? Because I'll tell you, if, if a, a husband doesn't treat his wife right and she's obedient and submitting to God, he's setting himself up for a good whipping from God. Huh? So ought men to love their wives as their own body. You know why? You know why they should do that? Because it, it is their own body. Huh? Did you know that, ladies? For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother and shall cleave to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. That's not a metaphor. That's not metaphorical speech. That is literal speech. Once you're married, your body's not yours. It's his. His body's not his. It's yours. Amen? Amen? Somebody's calling me. Y'all give me a minute. And the husband hath not power over his body, but the wife, right? Now, we're not going to get graphic with that right now, but there ain't going to be no sleeping on the couch. Huh? No, you you, you ain't going to do that today. Uh-uh. No, you can't do that. There's got to be agreement and a, a, a consent on all that, right? A man can't withhold his himself, his body from his wife, or vice versa. If you do that, you're sinning. Now, it, you know, if there's some kind of problem and a, a husband wants to be gracious about it and say, okay, honey, I, you know, it's no big deal to not, today. It's all right. We'll, we'll, he wants to love her like Christ loved the church. That's okay. But you, what I'm saying, there can't be no controlling one another with that thing. Amen? That's wrong. It's sinful. So, no man, notice what he says. So ought men to love their wives as their own body. He that loves his wife loves himself. For no man ever yet hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, even as the Lord, the church. You notice how this is all compared to to the Lord and His church. Husbands, if this isn't true of you, or if this isn't true of me, then I need to I need to go get on my knees for a little while and sit there and repent until God makes it so, makes my wife as important as to me as me. Amen. Because that's a hard one. It really is. A lot of lip service going on about that, but not a whole lot of practice in a lot of ways. For we are members of His body, Christ's body, of His flesh and of His bone. See, there's a comparison here with Christ and His church. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother and shall be joined unto his wife, and they too shall be one flesh. This is a great mystery. You see that? This is a great mystery. But I speak concerning Christ and the church. It's a great mystery. This is a, the word mystery here means something that was hidden that's now revealed. You now know that your body is no longer your own. You now know that when you get married, the two become one flesh. And what God hath joined together, let no man put asunder. I don't care if a judge writes you a bill of divorcement or not. What God joined together can't be separated. Now that's this pastor's position on that. Y'all can take it for what it's worth. Amen? Now, let me take one more step here in this. Uh, I've got just a couple more minutes I'll take here. We started late. Um, so we're talking about the father, uh, the, the, the wife, the husband, right? 
And whether you know it or not, the, the husband has two, uh, the husband and the wife have two hats they got to wear. Children, verse 1, chapter 6, verse 1. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Now, I want to just share that. I'm not going to bust out the Greek lexicon and all that. I'm just going to tell you this, and you can go look it up and research it for yourself if you want to. But the word children here just simply means offspring. There's another passage in 1 John that says where he says, my little children, right? Where he's talking, of course he's talking spiritual, but he's referring to baby Christians, right? Uh, my little children. So this this verse here is not talking about infants. It's not talking about young people. It's talking about the offspring of a father, right? Children, that is offspring, however old you are. If you're not, If you're still at home, you're not married. If you're not married, then you're still under obligation to honor your father and mother. Notice what he said. Children, obey your parents in the Lord. Well, somebody asked me the other day, what if my grandparents are my parents? Well, then obey your grandparents, amen? If they've taken that place in your life, amen? Or adopted parents, whatever. Children, obey your parents in the Lord. For this is right. Honor. Now, he, he, he quotes the Old Covenant here, just kind of to back it up. He's not, he's not using this to, to, to say he's saying this because the law says it. He's just, he's just showing the law as a secondary means of concluding this, right? Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with promise. Right? In, under the old covenant with the Jews, the, the commandment to honor your father and mother is the only commandment that had a promise. And look what he said. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with promise, that it may be well with thee, and thou mayest live long on the earth. Right? So you want to have a long... And it's not necessarily talking about, you know, living to be a hundred years old. He's talking about having a full, long, prosperous life. You know, my daddy was a drunkard. But you know, my daddy never told me to do wrong. Now, he set bad examples for me. I have to admit that, right? But if I would have listened to everything my daddy told me, I never would have went to prison. But I didn't because I, I was angry at him because he was a drunkard, right? And I thought he would never talk to me unless he was drinking. So I, I grew up angry at my father, right? That's why I'm telling you, if you want to have a dysfunctional family, just do the wrong thing. All you got to do to have a functional family is just get your life the best of your ability, the best of your all's ability, and line it up with the Word of God. No matter how bad you've done in the past, no matter how messed up it's been before, hey, time to get started. Amen? If God's redeemed you and given you a new, new start, a new heart and a new start, then time to start working to do it right you know and that includes patience and and long suffering to one another and you know not just putting up with one another but but giving one another time to grow and to learn amen it's necessary honor your father and mother you know honor you know what that means obey you know what that means right everybody know what it means to obey but what paul is saying here is don't just obey you know you can have a bad attitude and be rebellious have a rebellious spirit and still obey, right? What he's saying is there, obey your parents in the Lord. Honor your father and mother. That is, you're not just obeying them because, no, I have to, right? But because you understand that they're your parents and God requires it. And that God is going to use them to direct and govern your life. And if you'll honor your father and mother, God will bless you in, in a way that He won't if you don't. A lot of people don't do that and then they don't know what they missed by not doing it. Because they didn't do it. Amen? But I guarantee you, if you obey God and honor your wives, submit to your husbands, husbands love your wives, children obey your parents in the Lord, fathers, this is the last one, fathers, provoke not 
let, let me find it here. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with promise, that it may be well with thee, that thou mayest live long on the earth. And you fathers, provoke not your children to wrath. Now there's a there's a uh, there's more I could say about the honor part, but we we're out of time. But fathers, provoke not your children to wrath. And there's a way you can do that. My dad did it to me. It wasn't because he yelled at me and cursed me. It's because and he did do that too, but. He provoked me to wrath by not doing what this next part says, right? There's a contrast, Josh. Fathers, provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Instead of raising a bunch of angry kids because of your attitude, because you're wrong about everything and you care about yourself and nobody else, that's going to provoke your children to wrath. But if you bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord, which means you yourself are living for Christ, and you bring them up in an example and show them, not only tell them, but show them how to live for Christ. Bring them up. That means they're right there with you, side by side, watching you. They can see your mistakes as, as much as they can see your uh, your righteousness, right? There's nothing wrong with... You know, your child being able to see you make a mistake and you confess your sin and ask God's forgiveness and, and they can see that too. They can see God working because they're going to have to do that one time or another, right? Fathers, provoke not your children to wrath. That means you got to be understanding to them, right? You know, my daughter, according to Scripture, a daughter can't get married until her father gives her away, right? But he got to be real careful with that, right? We've got to be willing and able. Like, like Peter said when he's talking about wives, he says, he says to the husband, dwell with them according to knowledge. You know, women aren't men. They aren't like men. Women are weird. <laughs> men are strange. <laughs> I have to throw that in there before I get stoned, right? No, truly. Uh, somebody did say that in church one time. Man, women are weird. And then the lady looked at that guy and she said, yeah, but men are strange. Women are weird, men are strange. You know, God didn't make us the same. God took a rib out of a man and made him a helpmeet. But he, she is designed different. She is made fleshly in a way that a man is not made. The only creature on this earth not made from the dust of the earth is the woman. She was made out of the man. And she can meet a, a need in a man that no other creature can meet. And, and there's a design there designed to, to both test a man and to meet needs in a man and a man and a woman that nothing else and no one else can meet. He just made it that way. But women are weird, man. I mean, I, I, I've been married a long time. I've just about got a few things figured out. But about the time I think I got them figured out, something changes. No, I'm learning though. I've been I've been married how long? 40, 34 years. Been saved 42 years. And I still get an attitude sometimes when I'm having a bad day, but but I'm learning some things. I'm still learning what it means to for a husband to love his wife. I'm still learning what it means when Peter said dwell with them according to knowledge. That there are some things about a woman that a man has to learn because women aren't like men. And if you try to treat a woman like a man because she's doing this, then something there's going to be a problem. You're going to have a dysfunctional family. One guy said, "Well, as long as there's a woman in the family, it's going to be dysfunctional anyway." <laughs> but those are jokes, you know. <laughs> but anyway, I hope there's something to help you there tonight. We we're going to have to bring this to a close. Uh, but I'm thankful that God made women, right? And, and I know women think the same way, basically. But, but again, you have to understand that God, that a man and woman were made differently by design. It's not, it's not a fault. It's a design, right? Now, women have faults, yes. God said to Eve that she's going to want to control her husband, but he's going to rule over her because of the fault, because she sinned. And he said to Adam, because you've done this, by the sweat of your brow will you produce food for your family and it will bring thorns and thistles in the ground. Amen? So there are consequences to the fall. And because of those consequences, we have to fight every day 
with our with our dysfunction so that we don't have a really terribly dysfunctional family amen we got to work on this thing every day work on ourselves every day so we can have a biblical and a godly family that God can use amen ain't nobody perfect and there's going to be struggles and there's going to be hardships but we're not saying that in a way that those can't be overcome we're just saying just so that we can understand, just like with our body, we're going to have a struggle with sin. We're not going to ever be perfect. We're not going to ever arrive. When, is what I mean by it. I mean you can't conquer a particular sin and then move on to the next one. That's but but as long as we're in this body, we're going to have a struggle with sin because it dwells in us, right? And it's the same with the family. If you got eight family members and you got eight saints that have sin dwelling in them that they got to struggle with, right? But the closer you walk to the Lord and the more you die to yourself, the easier it is. Amen? There will be a little struggle, but th- hopefully your struggles are going to be uh, less than your joy. You'll have more joy than you have struggles, hopefully. Amen? Because it's a blessing to be a Christian. We just need to learn how to die to ourselves and live to God. That's the key. Amen? Dying to ourselves and living to God. Brother Newton, why don't you uh, pray for us? And if you would, uh, I don't know how many of the folks on that list you know, but we'll just take a few minutes here if you'll pray through the prayer list. And then uh, if Ernesto or anybody wants to pray, then they can, and then I'll close this. I said we were going to do it the other way around, but let's do it that way. If you want to add anything to the list, anybody you need to pray for, go for it. <coughs>